Welcome to the last event in Longmont Public Media's debate series for the 2021 City Council elections. I'm here with Marsha Martin today. We'll be conducting an informal Q&A because Marsha is running unopposed. If you're interested in Longmont Public Media's other content related to the 2021 City Council election, you should go to the youtube.com slash Longmont Public Media. There we have interviews with all of the candidates, uh, videos where they introduce themselves, and also recordings of the de debates that were run by Longmont Public Media this past week. Marsha, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Shaquille. So because Marsha is running unopposed, the format that we'll be doing today is I'll be reusing some of the questions that we asked the other candidates during the debate. Marsha will answer them to the best of her ability, and I'll take the liberty to ask a few follow-up questions. Marsha, are you ready to begin? I am. I'd like to thank everyone for um, watching. I'm Marsha Martin. I represent Ward 2 on the Longmont City Council, which is the whole South Side. And I'm very glad to be here and have the opportunity to talk about my ideas, even though I don't have anyone to debate, which is sort of a disappointment, but not that big a disappointment. All right, Marsha, my first question for you is, The three most crucial challenges facing the city of Longmont, and what are your solutions for addressing them? Well, if they had solutions, they wouldn't be the most cru crucial problems. But there are two kinds of crucial problems, first of all. I want to say there are urgent problems and there are critical problems. Many problems are both. Our most urgent problem is the housing shortage, which is leading to an increase in homelessness. Our most critical problem is climate change and the need to reduce our carbon footprint and use renewable energy for everything we do. do you to address, <coughs> Excuse me. So while you may not think that, you know, if, if, if these problems were solvable, they may have already been solved to your point, but do you have proposed solutions for some of these problems that you'd like to quickly address? Absolutely. So uh, let's take the urgent problem first. We have really three things that are stopping Longmont from improving its housing inventory. Um, the first is that we are having a really hard time uh, moving projects through the permitting process so that we can get them out of the ground. And there are several reasons for that, um, but the biggest one is the second issue, which is that we have failed to align our inclusionary zoning ordinance with uh, our ordinary land use codes and failed to uh, adjust the Envision Longmont goals to uh, reflect our newer understanding of what the architecture of a landlocked city uh, that has an economic future really needs to be. It's all around urban density and making sure that uh, workforce or attainable housing is in much higher supply than it is now. We're starting to get a handle on affordable housing or subsidized housing. I would say within two to three years, we will have made huge progress on that because the Longmont Housing Authority is under better management and it is um, funded better than it ever has been before. So we expect as many as 2,000 new dwelling units in the next two to three years and that's going to take a huge amount of pressure off Longmont's people at the low end. Can you address how aligning the inclusionary housing ordinance with the overall goals of the city will help make this process work better? Sure. Um, what happens now 
is, is that if, if a, a project is exactly what Longmont needs, but it runs afoul of some land use code or, um, or another, for example, the ratio of parking, on-site parking for an, a multifamily unit to dwelling units, uh, then it gets hung up in, in uh, the permitting process and, and it tends to go around and around in circles and everyone knows that we really don't need that much on-site parking if you've got an apartment building that is right on the bus line that is mostly studio and one bedroom apartments nobody's going to have three cars but the formula is based on some incorrect assumptions about how many cars people are going to want so we need to fix that we need to fix it in the land use code and we have people in permitting and people on on the planning and zoning board that were trained to follow the code in at, at a minute level and they're not going to stop doing that so we need to fix the code to put the um, their to align with their expectations and get these projects out of the ground because they would make a huge difference in terms of the available supply of housing and how balanced it is with the needs of the public in Longmont. So what one thing would you do to make Longmont a more livable city? I would encourage people to get out of their cars. You know, people think that Longmont has uh, really bad traffic congestion. If you look, if you compare Longmont stats to nationwide statistics, even for towns our own size, we don't. But we have a couple of hours a day where our, um, where our uh, traffic is annoying. It's not really deeply, deeply congested. And those are the commute so, hours. Yeah, so are, are you suggesting that people get out of their cars during the commute hours? I suggest that we make ourselves a city where people commute less. And that means that we're a city where you can live where you work. Commuting, especially for people of average and low incomes, who are the people who can't afford to live here, by the way, um, steals time and it steals money. It, it actually lowers their effective rate of pay because they're paying to operate an automobile paying to own an automobile, insure an automobile, making car payments. And if they lived in Longmont in an urban, dense, walkable environment, then they might be able to walk or bike to work most of the year. They definitely would um, not be on the exits and entrances to Longmont where the congestion is because they would be at work already. And so everybody's happier. You know, the employers are happy because their people are happier. The workers are happy because they spend less time on the road and more time doing things like bonding with their families and cooking healthy dinners. And they have more money to buy healthy dinners with because they're not spending the money on their automobile. So a city where it's possible to live where you work and, and have fewer commuters in or out is a much more livable city than a city that is based on the concept of commuting. And I really want to say that in the debates that have preceded me, a lot of the candidates had it wrong because they were all talking about improving community, commuting. And commuting isn't the issue. The issue is living here. So uh, I happen to work in Louisville, and I'm one of a lot of people who work in an industry that isn't super well represented within the city limits. Mm -hmm. I am probably going to work outside the city of Longmont for a really long time, but I really like living here. Mm -hmm. um, is there going to be a solution for people like me, or is my solution going to have to be to leave the city? Well, I certainly hope the city that your solution isn't to leave the city. But in fact, the... Um, the, the commuting problem is not entirely under Longmont's control. I feel that uh, we could make a deal with uh, the Regional Transportation District to... You're talking about RTD. RTD, yeah. I try to not use acronyms, but of course everybody knows it by the name RTD and don't know what it stands for. 
So anyway, RTD uh, has basically failed Longmont, right? They haven't given us the train. They keep trying to cut our um, intra-city bus lines because they don't make much money, even though Longmont subsidizes them. Isn't that because those buses suck? It is, and that's part of the problem. They can't afford Longmont. You know, they miscalculated. Bad things happened to them. I'm not going to get into whether it was, you know, bad management on their part or unexpected events in the economy or what. But the fact is they ran out of money before they got to Longmont, and now they're trying to meet their basic commitments to Longmont on a shoestring. And so we get the oldest, biggest, stinkiest buses doing uh, very long, slow routes through Longmont. And it isn't good for anybody. It really isn't good for anybody, except that um, unhoused people can get on them and stay warm. Uh, but that's not necessarily uh, a good reason for running a big, stinky diesel bus all around the town. Although it's a solution that's been used before, I've learned. Uh, so the thing that we should do over the years is negotiate with RTD to focus our taxes that we can't get out of paying to RTD um, on intercity solutions, because that's the only thing they've shown any real competence at. And so if they focus on bus rapid transit into um, into Boulder, and if they focus on maybe partnering with Amtrak and the Biden administration and whoever it takes to finally get us some sort of a train, then and get out of our way and let us come up with another kind of a solution for intercity transit, then it helps people like you, Shaquille, that are still going to get out of town, and it also helps people who are on the work-live bandwagon, because if we had a Longmont-centric intra-city solution, then um, we could have a subscription system where um, Longmont United Hospital, for example, could subscribe to a bus line and um, pick up its people and bring them to work right on their shift times. That would, that would save everybody a lot and it would save a lot of traffic in, in Longmont. Uh, in the meantime, um, RTD would stop wasting money on a solution that is never going to be good for Longmont. They try every year to cut intra-city bus lines, and we always talk them out of it because we've got to have something. And, and so it's really important to put money where it belongs, and then we can have good intra-city transportation, and also have commuter transit that's appropriate. So you mentioned at the top of this that you felt like one of the, the most crucial challenges facing the city is the global challenge of climate change. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you think the ethical obligation of the city of Longmont is to limit carbon emissions in order to address the global challenge of climate change, right? Because part of the, part of the, the catch-22, if you want to call it that, is that while the city of Longmont would certainly have the ability to reduce its carbon emissions almost arbitrarily by regulation if it really wanted to, the fact is that it's a global problem. So does it really make sense, for example, for people within the city of Longmont to pay higher electrical rates in order to reduce our city's carbon emissions when everyone around us is going to go around and business as usual? Uh, well, first of all, that isn't what's going to happen. Um, Longmont's electrical rates are almost the lowest in the state. You know, the bottom four kind of bounce around depending on who's adjusted their rates most recently. But we have some of, we always have some of the lowest electrical rates in the state. Um, what's going to happen as we make the renewable transition is that our rates will go uh, up as we make capital investments at the regional level, the Platte River Power Authority, or PRPA, they're going to go up a little bit um, because capital investments will have to be made. But it doesn't take very long at all, according to the models, for the rates to begin going down again fairly precipitously because there's no fuel involved when you have made the renewable transition. You know, it's free. On the other hand, 
natural gas and coal are going to get more expensive because the demand pattern for them is going to change. Has PRPA ever lowered electrical rates? No, and in terms of, of the faceplate dollar uh, cost, they probably never will. But they have raised rates below the, or, or increased rates below the rate of inflation. In fact, that's going to happen this year, right? Is, is that our rate of inflation, which is going to be somewhere between 4 and 6% by the end of 2021, is going to exceed the PRPA's wholesale um, electric rates by a couple percent. That won't happen every year, but everybody needs to understand that lowering a utility rate is really a relative thing that happens with respect to uh, what everything else costs. And if you consider the cost of breathing polluted air, breathing coal particulate, you know, the whole social cost of carbon thing, then we're always lowering electrical rates as we lower our carbon footprint. So one reason is that. Another, another reason is, is that we're going to get healthier, right? And, and I was the person who in, in introduced the first resolution in the Platte River Power Authority service area, um, which consists of Longmont, Loveland, Estes Park, and Fort Collins, to introduce, I introduced the resolution that said, we're going to get to 100% renewably generated electricity by the year 2030, which was pretty aggressive in 2018 when it happened. And within the year, by the end of that year, all four cities had passed similar re resolutions, which forced the Platte River Power Authority to go along because we own them. And so they, they had to make an effort that they were actually reluctant to make to begin the transition. And the fact that an area like us can do that and make progress and maybe attain that goal when everybody else is still fighting about whether it's possible or not is going to be a form of leadership that can be copied by utilities across the United States. So can you speak a little bit about how you feel about the ethical obligation to fight climate change? Um, you know, I think you've spoke pretty eloquently here about the ability to do so and the opportunities uh, specifically afforded by the fact that Longmont's in sort of a unique arrangement by virtue of owning its electrical utility. Mm -hmm. But why should we? I mean, what, what is there an ethical obligation or is it purely utilitarianism? It's for our children. I mean, is, are the ethics really in doubt? This is something that we have to do because the survivability of the kind of lifestyle that we have now really depends on, on our doing this and our considering ourselves to be in a race to do this. Um, there are a lot of, of equity-based things that go along with it, right? We have an ethical obligation to find ways to create jobs in Weld County because if we don't do that, either there's going to be a famine when the extraction industry collapses or we're going to be drugged back by those people whose jobs depend on the extraction industry pulling back on, on our progress with all their might. And both of those things are happening now. You know, Weld County hasn't experienced a collapse yet, but other places in the country absolutely have. All the places that were dependent on coal, you know, so like in West Virginia and stuff, have already experienced that collapse. And we have an ethical obligation to mitigate the collapse and change people's hearts and minds in the process. Because, you know, right now, the people that are dependent on the extraction industry kind of hate us. Ask me something else now. How would you address residents' complaints regarding urban noise, such as the airport, trains, and fireworks? You know, this is a, a fairly easy question, and nobody's going to believe me when I talk about the solution. Um, 
we have, based on the history of the last 18 months, made it really hard to be a police officer. You know, we've taken away protections from them for when they exceed their authority or use too much force. And I absolutely believe in that, by the way, because I think that, although not in Longmont for the last 40 years, but at earlier times and in other places, police have done that. So I understand why police are annoyed. Um, we are also in a position where we have a lot of people who are really jealous of their minor freedoms and are doing things like putting strike pipe mufflers on their cars and getting fireworks that are illegal in Colorado and shooting them off all spring and summer. And, uh, and those things may really reduce the quality of life in Longmont, and it's too bad. And you take those attitudes and you put them together, and it means that what we really shouldn't be doing is using um, patrol cars to enforce that kind of infraction. And you can detect that kind of infraction and document that kind of infraction with smart city style automation. In other words, you can have noise monitors around the city that hear and triangulate the motion of a car with a straight pipe muffler. You know, you can detect a car with uh, who's rolling coal. And then you can, just like on a toll road, take a picture of the license plate and send the person a citation later. Um, so, so what you're proposing is essentially that uh, a system of microphones distributed throughout the city would have the ability to detect that sort of noise. Essentially, yes. I mean, that's how do I know? How, how do I? So I'm not necessarily, I don't think of myself as one of those people who's jealous of minor freedoms. But I don't know that I'm wild about the government having the ability to listen to everything I say on the streets. Well, the government doesn't can't hear everything you say because the microphones are tuned to the point where they don't. It doesn't even wake up the surveillance system until you are exceeding the uh, noise ordinance threshold, and then all it can do is you know it's not taking video of, video of you and it's not listening to what you're saying inside your car. Because we don't have any technology that can do that. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some government agency scary somewhere that, that can do that, but we certainly are, are still fine tuning the technology that's just going to tri triangulate the uh, trajectory of a really noisy muffler. But the probability of compliance if somebody who's not driving and who's not all spun up and is not interested in making noise at this moment. Um, with their modified vehicle, gets a citation in the mail, they're much more likely to pay that than they, than they are to be nice to a patrol car that pulls them over for it. And, um, and in the meantime, the patrol car can go follow, you know, do something more important, right? Be there when there's an accident, for example. So. That, okay, so that's an enforcement mechanism, mm -hmm. but that doesn't speak to the issue of deterrence because, of course, if you have the opportunity to roll through the city of Longmont for a couple of hours and make noise in your straight pipe car, uh, you don't get that citation for, what, a couple of weeks, maybe it's a month, you know, or maybe even if it's the next day, right? That's mm -hmm. not an issue of deterrence because quality of life has already been reduced for the other people. Well, that's true the first time. Um, but eventually, you know, why don't you go peeking in people's mailboxes to see if there's any presence in it? You know, it's because we've got decades of, of people just internalizing that it's a felony to peek inside people's mailboxes. And I leave stuff in my mailbox and people don't peek inside and I get it, you know, three days later. And I know a lot of people who do the same. And this is in the same culture where, um, Amazon packages get stolen off the front porch with fair regularity. But we have a population that is conditioned to not get inside your mailbox. So it is a way to effect change and a way to do enforcement without abusing our uh, resources for public safety. So the other part of your, your response that I have a question about is the idea that this isn't a good use of officers' time. Yeah. And this stands in really interesting contrast to the responses that we got during the, 
the at-large city council debate and also the mayoral debate, where there seemed to be a fairly high level of enthusiasm for directing patrol and enforcement, you know, direct enforcement resources towards this problem. People who are mad about being inconvenienced by noise are always going to jump to the solution that is obvious, you know, and we have a cultural pattern of saying, yeah, well, if you commit a public infraction regarding road behavior, then you're supposed to get pulled over by a cop and get a ticket. And that's the way it works. And if, if you are setting off illegal fire, fireworks, then your neighbor's supposed to be able to report you, and a police person is supposed to come to that address and give people a ticket. And the problem is that they're not considering the whole picture. So they think it should be easy. All you have to do is add more police or put more police on duty that one night or, or you know, whatever the immediate solution, the obvious solution appears to be. But the, um, the fact is that it doesn't pencil out. And the fact is that it's nearly impossible if you're not sitting in, in an unmarked car on the block where they're setting off the fireworks, it's almost impossible to catch someone in the act which is the only way you can ticket somebody for fireworks. So we need to look outside the box at other solutions. That's all there is to it. So let's move on to another question. You um, had- Good, because that's a really fiddly annoying question. So uh, you'd mentioned multifamily housing earlier. Yes. Um, do you believe that Longmont should allow multifamily housing in every neighborhood in the city? I would like to get there. Cities have done it, you know, Minneapolis did it, and there wasn't an insurrection, at least not about multifamily housing. Um, so, uh, yeah, Longmont is surrounded by open space. That is statutorily project protected, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's overwhelmingly supported by the public. You know, to the extent that if, if we like get two inches over the line or, or use the open space for something that is not absolutely um, uh, nature areas or agriculture, the public comes and talks to the city council about it and says, you're misusing that land, pay the... I've actually never heard about this. Can, can you tell me an in, about an instance of that happening? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, one instance is... is um, uh, on, uh, access roads for oil and gas. We had a statutory obligation to provide the road. It happened to go through open space and it uh, caused a fuss. Um, and, you know, it was settled. It, I mean, the statutory obligation is a statutory obligation and a taking is a taking. And, you know, which would be what it would be if we just refused and shut down any access at all to a mineral right, because this is Colorado and we haven't got our priorities straight yet on that subject. Um, but the, um, the point is, I think, that we need to learn, learn to live within our boundaries but still have a viable economy. So, for example, I, I recently became a homeowner. I live in Old Town. Mm -hmm. um, there is a big open field right near where I live that mm -hmm. was going to be the... Uh, it was going to be the Bone Farm co-working organization. It was. Um, and there could plausibly be, I don't know, 20 houses, 60 houses. You know, it, it's about six acres worth of land. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, 300 condos. Yep. Um, and a lot of people in my neighborhood talk about how they sort of wish, you know, it's sort of nice to just have a big open field in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of, you know, it's nice because the dogs get to go there and it's a nice big open space. And they sort of wish that the city would just not let anyone develop it. Why can't we do that? Well, it's private land. Um, and well, but the city could just deny a permit for construction. Well, up to a point, yes. But the we have zoning ordinances to actually... Um, Zoning ordinances were two ways. You know, one is they protect the city from uh, unpleasant uses, right? We, there's no place in Longmont where you can build a tannery, right, which would make 
you know, you're talking about a leather tannery, a leather tannery, right? Which would make what the turkey plant used to smell smell like seem like nothing at all, right? A tannery stinks, and you, so you we have zoning, and you can't build a tannery in Longmont, um, but instead, you know, we have density ord ordinances, we have you know mixed work use versus res residential uh, ordinances. And that also, it protects the neighborhood, but it also protects the landowner. It's protecting the landowner from exactly what you suggested, which is refusing to permit anything so that it, you know, the, the land was, was, is, is essentially open space. But that's what I mean when we're talking about a taking, because, you know, our system of, of, of ownership and yeah, capitalism, or at least commerce, wouldn't work if people didn't have some assurance that investments they made in property would have a return. So it's you know it's a it's a cooperation. Um, I told a lot of people and annoyed most of them when they were objecting about the bone farm development that you know, they said what everyone always says when there's a new development next door to them, which is it's going to make a lot more traffic. And I don't want a lot more traffic. I want my neighborhood to stay just the way it is right now. Um, and I would say, well, you know, you really should be rooting for that development because it's not very dense. And it is, uh, you know, has some commercial aspects that are <laughs> organic farming. You know, and you can go to the farmer's market that they're going to going to run, and, and you can walk to it, and it's kind of going to be an asset to the neighborhood. Um, but they said, well, it's denser than, than my neighborhood. You know, well, it kind of isn't because they've got a lot of open land around the housing, you know. But, but it could be, as you suggested, a bunch of five-story multifamily units that would in fact increase density a lot and instead it was going to be a co-working development that only increased density a little bit so you mentioned earlier you know the the value of property as an investment so mm -hmm. uh, that is another aspect of living in old town which is that there are a lot of homes which are owned by investors or people who live out of town and they're sort of just holding on to the house and renting it out as a way to get a return on investment um, what about the prospect of building multifamily housing in Old Town? Wouldn't that be a good idea to help make housing more affordable in the whole city by reducing the cost in what is generally considered the most desirable part of town? Well, there's, uh, there is a lot of controversy about that. Um, I think almost everyone believes that the unique and now really essentially unbuildable architectures uh, that exists in Old Town should be protected, that, that, that the flavor of those neighborhoods should be protected. Uh, on the other hand, they do take up a lot of land, and there are a lot of them are on big lots. Some of the owners want to build accessory dwelling units in the backyard or um, you know, build carriage houses uh, you know, lots of different models for increasing the density without really changing the primary dwelling. And that's where the controversy lies, because some people want no changes at all. And because parking is, is not plentiful in those neighborhoods, because, you know, they're older than the proliferation of automobiles, um, a lot of people don't want that to happen. Um, and so there's, there's a fight about it because we, we need more density. And in some ways, I think Old Town shouldn't be exempt from providing increased density. And a lot of the people who already own homes there need the extra income or the extra space they could get from an auxiliary dwelling unit just to be able to stay there. So you know, there's a, a, a real dialectic in terms of, of individual property rights versus the character of the neighborhood, versus um, what urban engineering can do to make uh, a, a gradual increase of density tolerable. Getting people out of their cars, making the neighborhoods more walkable, providing 
uh, usable public transit corridors, all of those would help us reclaim space in Old Town that could be used for increased density without destroying the character of the neighborhood. Now, I don't like the phrase the character of the neighborhood because a lot of times it is, it's, it's a code, it's a dog whistle for opposing change. And, you know, we have missed the window for opposing change. We have a critical problem. We have two critical problems that uh, climate change and the housing shortage, and we will be negligent if we don't address those problems. Well, as someone who lives in Old Town, I might say, but what about a lot of these new developments on the north side of town that are after the development of the automobile? And these houses have gigantic lots that they're not particularly well utilized. Um, and, you know, these people have two or three car garages and these huge driveways. Why don't we densify those neighborhoods? And we should, and they have far less claim to protection, if any, than, um, than Old Town because Old Town is really something unique. Um, but all of the developments that we built during the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and the early part of the 2010s are just subdivisions. There's nothing unique about them other than you live in it and it's home to you. But your quality of life is not gonna be changed if there is a five-plex on the corner, or a row of townhomes in the next block. And there are people in the older neighborhoods. So for example, Southmore Park um, has houses that were built in the 60s. That, house is, that, that neighborhood's going to have to have its electric infrastructure and its sewer infrastructure updated just to remain livable and just to accommodate electrification. And when those things happen, you know, we could make, the, make it possible for people to build auxiliary dwelling units in their huge backyards, and it could keep people in their houses. A lot of the families who live there uh, culturally um, like to live in multi-generational groupings, and the houses, you know, which probably have one and a half baths maybe, if they're lucky, um, you know, it would, it would help their lifestyle a lot if they could have an auxiliary dwelling unit, maybe that was subsidized by the city. It increases density and it reinforces um, their cultural preserved, preferred lifestyle. So, you know, that kind of thing, if, if the city makes helps by making the infrastructure support it, then everybody wins. It's not something to fight. It's, it's, it's something that can improve people's life. Let's move on to the next question. Should Longmont's next light service be, a made, be made available to residents at cost? At cost is... Um, Let is me define cost for you. Okay, because there are lots of ways to define costs and one of them involves re retiring the debt. So uh, when, I, when I say allowing uh, Longmont to, you know, re, uh, next light to be made available at cost, that includes certainly paying down any bond debt that has been that okay. was made to uh, build the facilities in the first place, mm -hmm. ongoing maintenance, the cost of labor, the ongoing cost of the service, right? The cost that would be required to operate Next Light in perpetuity for the benefits of the of the residents of the city, and to keep it, you know, being a market leading or a country leading uh, internet service provider but for the city of Longmont and maybe some adjacent communities if they'd be interested in that. And the answer to, uh, to that is yes, and essentially it is, because it's a Colorado and, uh, enterprise. It has to be self-sustaining, which means it has to be able to retire its debt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we need to understand is that the cost of maintaining social equity also needs to count. All right, because there are some people in Longmont who are getting their service below cost, and in order to have um, a stable society, a nurturing society to support the education of our young people, we have to do that. You know, there are plenty of families in Longmont who wouldn't have internet access at all if they couldn't get next light below cost. 
you're referring to people who are taking advantage of the, the city's 1495 per month program? Or are you referring that, who, who, who's getting the next light below cost? Well, those people are some. Um, the St. Vrain Valley School District, um, the, um, uh, the city is in the process of, with new grant money, um, and ARPA money, in fact, um, building out uh, Wi-Fi hotspots in the city that anybody can use, and, uh, and that's part of the cost of Next Light 2. So, you know, essentially, what we need to do is make sure that everybody has, has ubiquitous access. Um, for that matter, there are a whole bunch of people that were, took part, as I did, in, in, in bootstrapping the service, you know, bought it, as what, without uh, when it was first available, without any knowledge of whether um, it was going to work well or not, you know, we had faith, right? And so it's fifty dollars a month for me for the rest of my life. At some point, that's going to be below cost for me. Um, and then finally, it's going to need to be upgraded because of the vision of the people who put. Uh, the infrastructure in, we only have to um, upgrade access points to convert our one gigabit ethernet to 10 gigabit ethernet. And that's going to happen sooner than ever I thought it would. Um, but your definition of that cost is, is, is kind of fungible there, you know. But the fact is that, that nobody's getting fat from next light. Next Light has way better customer service than any competing service. You know, if you call Next Light and you say, my internet's slow and I don't understand, not only will they talk you through resetting your modem if you don't know how to do that, um, they will talk you through running a speed test if you don't know how to do that, and if nothing works and it really truly isn't riding the way it should, they'll, bring, they'll send somebody out. You try to get Comcast to do that. You know, it didn't happen. Um, so, so, I, so let me uh, ask you another question related to this. So I also get access to the charter member rate. So my personal residence, um, I get one gigabit, ether, one gigabit fiber service for mm -hmm. $50 a month, which is great. And mm -hmm. it is a wonderful service that I love using. I also used to own a small business. Mm -hmm. And for $50 a month at my business, I believe I got 30 megabits down and about one megabit up. In mm -hmm. order to get the same rate, or the same speeds that I get at home, I would have had to pay $600 per month. Yes. Why is that? I have no idea. Um, but what I do know is that the um, Economic Development Partnership opposes that, you know, that the, the rates need to be aligned better. Um, there were a bunch of unknowns when those original rates were set. You know, we didn't know how many commercial adopters there would be. We didn't know how important it was going to be to business development. And we didn't know, um, uh, you know, what the bandwidth pattern, what the usage patterns were going to be. So now that we do know those things and we are planning a, a speed upgrade, um, then those rates will be regularized to be com com commercially competitive because just Longmont's low uh, electrical rates and the reliability of our fiber ethernet service is already a huge draw in terms of, of um, recruiting uh, new businesses to come to Longmont. And that's a delicate uh, negotiation because we, we don't want to um, overbuild with new primary employers and you know strain at the at the seams. So what we want is is new businesses that will pay high wages, um, bring a small number of people in with them, and employ people who already work here, but uh, have the effect of of raising people's wages, making the live work problem simpler. Can city council direct Nextlight to lower their commercial rates? We can't direct them to violate the terms of the bond agreement. Okay. But uh, we can direct them, although right now we don't need to because our, um, the, ne the director of, of, of Next Light Services is, is right on board 
with both business development and social equity. And so she's doing what she should, what, what we're asking people to do anyway. Okay. Many residents in the community struggle to afford the rising cost of childcare. Should the city address childcare affordability? The, child, the city already is addressing childcare affordability, which is one of the things that really upsets me with our current crop of candidates is that they don't know that. Um, so the thing that needs to be done, first of all, um, Governor Polis is on board with the idea of improving childcare and early childhood education in the whole state. And so there is um, money to subsidize these activities. Um, Council Member Waters, about a year and a half ago, you know, slightly pre-pandemic, um, founded and grew a, an early childhood education consortium of many stakeholders throughout not just Longmont, but, but Boulder County. And um, they are in, 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 envisioning different models for um, making childcare work better and early childhood education work better. We have private, subsidized, and friends and family childcare in Longmont, and the level of quality and cost of all of those things could be regularized by forming a network of support services that would make sure that the care caregivers knew what they needed to, to know, had um, support for improving the quality of their service, had backup, you know, if, um, like, like the network of substitute teachers that the public school system has. You know, so if, if, if one daycare center was shorthanded or one home caregiver got sick, you, you would have a network that would help you make sure that the, that the children affected stayed covered and the parents affected kept, got to keep working. Um, you know, the pandemic broke childcare and that consortium, in, because they were talking about the impacts, many of the participants, of course, were actually daycare, childcare, and child education caregivers. And they said, we can't get PPE. We, you know, we don't know how to get substitute teachers. We have to close down if somebody gets sick. And um, what happened with that was that Dr. Waters went to the city and says, we have a supply chain for getting these ungettable supplies and we can get them at very low cost. Can we um, use emergency funding to provide them to daycare? And it turned out that the answer was yes. Can and you explain to me why it's so important that the city was helping daycares as opposed to you know any other institution? What, what's so important about daycare for the city? Helping daycare helps every other uh, institution that uses frontline workers. Because if the frontline workers aren't there, it's like dominoes, you know? If, if, if you can't run your grocery store, if you can't run a delivery restaurant, then it affects all kinds of people. It affects elders that are locked down at home. You know, and I know people, immune compromised older people that are still locked down after all this time, even though they're vaccinated, um, you know, they're immune compromised and they don't feel safe living their pre-pandemic normal lives yet. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a cascade. If childcare is broken, then just like dominoes, a whole lot of city institutions fall. Nurses have their kids in daycare, right? Orderlies have their kids in, neighbor, in daycare. Doctors have their kids in daycare care. Um, everybody needs it. And now, what a lot of people, don't, it's not, not talked about in terms of why people can't hire, why businesses that are reopening can't hire. But the fact is, a big piece of it is that parents are afraid to go back to work because they're not sure that Childcare is reliable, so somebody's still take, staying home. And how many people does that take out of the workforce? So I remember hearing a, a conversation, I think this might have been during a city council meeting, where Harold Dominguez, the city manager, was discussing uh, 
the process of how the city government was sort of going to get up and running again. And I believe that this was during that brief window where we thought the pandemic was ending and people stopped wearing masks everywhere during the mm -hmm. summer. And I remember Harold mentioning that part of the challenge that the city was facing was staffing all of the shifts because, you know, the city is a 24 seven operation. It's not mm -hmm. just about, you know, the people who work at next light or the people who work in the city manager's office or the city attorney's office. It's the people who staff parks and recreation, the people who staff the, um, you know, the city, all of the city services that have to operate 24 hours a day. And Harold mentioned that part of the problem was, you know, not all of these people live in the city and he wasn't sure when schools were going to reopen and when people would be able to come into the office on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that fundamentally an issue of childcare for them? That is largely an issue of childcare for them. It's also a, comes back to the whole live work idea. You know, people who work for the city of Longmont, some of them prefer you know, to live in Frederick or to live in Lafayette or, or you know, whatever. Um, but a lot of them would like to live here because they get a big chunk of their lives back if they do, but they can't afford it. You know, if you work for uh, in the engineering department and, and you're a water engineer or, or um, you know, a sewage engineer or a meter reader, you can't afford to buy a house in Longmont. But we would like that to be true. So is there, is there some way that we can make it more affordable for city employees to live in the community that they serve? Are you suggesting that, um, that we subsidize those employees? I, think I don't know. Is that something the city would be interested in? Like, like, do you think that that's a, a good solution to that problem? I hadn't considered it before. Uh, and on the one hand, you know, the city's never been in the real estate business. Um, Longmont struggles to keep its workforce paid essentially at parity with uh, workers with the same job description in, in other cities throughout the state. Um, we, we're, we're aiming for 102% of, of the, or, you know, 2% above the average. Um, and we're not quite there. We're between 100% and 101%. Um, so uh, everybody is, we're, you know, we're trying to raise people's wages. We couldn't increase the, the parity this year, you know, incre get to the 102 because we have, you know, a lot of inflation. And so the average wage is going up. Um, and that means that Longmont just had to struggle to keep where, you know, to stand still. Um, but that might be one way, you know, if the benefits package were increased, uh, it might work. It also could be, because I don't know all the nuances of municipal uh, regulation, it might be impossible. So it's, it's a good idea. I would be interested in looking into it. It, it might be more possible because now the Longmont Housing Authority and, um, and, and the city of Longmont are closer together under common administration. On the other hand, it would be a perk that a lot of people couldn't avail themselves of because it, it reduces their choice you know, of dwelling. It would be much better if people could choose where they wanted to live and choose their lifestyle and, and not have to give up income. So uh, the last question that I want to ask you is a question of ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, during the other debates, we asked this as a yes or no question, but I don't think we're constrained by that format here. So uh, Seven minutes. Yeah, so, so I, I'd, I'd like to get a little bit more uh, of your take on this question. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you trust that this election will be fairly tabulated and the results fairly adjudicated by the Boulder County Clerk? Absolutely, and I have a lot of good reasons why. Um, before I joined the municipal government, uh, I had about a two-year period of retirement where I was ramping down family obligations and looking for the next thing that I was going to do because I was so done with the private sector. Um, and one of the things that I did was serve as an election judge uh, in Boulder County elections for two primaries and one general election the 2016 general election, which was pretty exciting. Um, and when they train election judges, they explain 
all of the processes and all of the security. And I was already pretty much a data scientist and pretty much a process maven before taking that training. And I will tell you that there are no loopholes in Boulder County's system, none. I, I would stake my life on it. They just did a brilliant job of securing the election, making it unhackable, making the documents unfakeable, and without the only way that you can that you can subvert our election system is to have an insider subvert it. And you'd have to have plants to subvert it because one of the things that in the process is that it is that you can't do anything with secure documents without a person, uh, two people, one from each party and it, or one from differing parties because you could have a Green and a Republican or a Libertarian and a Democrat. Um, but uh, usually it's a Republican and a Democrat because major party. Um, but there's nobody who shares the same interest in hacking the, the documents that's ever allowed to handle them. So yes, there is, you know, you, you'd have to have a clerk after the fact, like happened down in the, in the southwest corner, you know, where there's somebody who is actively trying to... Um, I believe it was Mesa County. Mesa County. There you go. Um, you know, it took me a minute to summon it, too. I couldn't Yeah, well, that, and I was talking, so I had no summoning bandwidth yet. But that's what it would take. It would take somebody who deliberately and maliciously wanted to subvert the process and they got caught, didn't they? So there are some people who believe that, you know, there are county clerks out there who are trying to tip the results of the election in some way that they might personally favor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, as you said, you spent most of your career in the private sector. Um, you volunteered, I guess, for these for these elections, uh, and then shortly after that got elected to city council. Mm -hmm. In your experience, can you speak to the, the level of ethics that you've seen in civic employees, either at the county level or the city level? Can you imagine some of those people attempting to deliberately subvert an election? No. You... Why not? I mean, isn't it, wouldn't it be in their personal interest to do so? I hope not. I hope that they are all better at connecting the dots than that. Because if that became successful, we would lose democracy and lose our civilization. And if they understood the reality of it, nobody would want that. OK. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? Yeah. Um, and it's a good segue from what we were talking about. You know, what we need to do is get back to Walter Cronkite style evidence-based thinking. We need to know what the truth is, be willing to accept alternatives, be willing to listen to each other's arguments, and not be stuck in, in anybody's ideological rut. And right now we're in a situation where almost everybody is, seems to be stuck in an ideological rut. But it's no fun, you know? You're down there in the rut. Let's talk to each other and, and find a consensus that we can all understand to make this a better place to live. Thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience and anyone who's watching. Uh, this is the end of our 2021 debate series for the 2021 City Council election for the City of Longmont. If you'd like to see more of content like this, you can go to the Longmont Public Media YouTube page where we have candidate interview, interviews with all of the candidates, including videos where they get to introduce themselves. We have a debate with the 2021 at-large candidates where all six candidates were present on stage at the same time, and a mayoral debate. Shaquille, I hate to interrupt, but you forgot to give me a chance to say thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to this wonky discussion 
I really enjoyed it, and I hope you did. There, go ahead. You can finish up now. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, Marsha, can you provide a little bit of information if anyone would want to hear from you more or ask you any follow-up questions? Marsha42.com. Uh, and my Facebook page is Marsha42 as well. Like it, leave me a question, and I, will, I answer every city council call and every email. So I'm accessible. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>